church, uh, we, we are going to uh, continue our series on the Sermon, the sermon on the Mount uh, from Matthew 5 to Matthew chapter 7. And uh, if you recall correctly, uh, we are in uh, Matthew chapter 6 from verse 5 to verse 15. And uh, this is about the Lord's Prayer. Uh, uh, this is a very important sermon because it talks about prayer. And prayer is at the center of uh, the life of the church. Uh, we are going to read the, the text first, and then, uh, and then I will share with you what I received from the Lord. Uh, can, can I, may I have someone to, to read? Uh, uh, thank you, Mark. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, please. <coughs> When you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like the pagans. For they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. This, then, is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And let us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive other their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. Thank you very much, Mark. Uh, let, let's pray. Let's bow ahead and pray. Uh, dear Lord, uh, I come humbly before you to bring your word to this to your people here. You love us, you love us so much that uh, you give us the food of today, your word, to nourish us. And we thank you for that, Lord, because it is a light on our path. It opens our eyes on things that we do not understand. It clears our view. It gives us life. We thank you for that, Lord. I pray that uh, your Holy Spirit will speak through me, Lord. Let me decrease and let you increase now, please. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. The sermon of today, it's about prayer, but you know, th there, is a, there is a great paradox about prayer. Uh, this paradox is that uh, in the Bible, Jesus in Matthew 21, verse 22, he says, If you believe, you will receive whatever you ask for in prayer. Uh, this is an amazing promise. So Jesus, our Lord, tells us that when we pray, whatever we ask will be given to us if we believe. So if really this is true, everyone should be running to prayer because everything you, you, you want, you ask, will be given to you. But this is a dream. This is amazing. He says that so, there are only two options. Either Jesus is lying or he's telling the truth. If he's telling the truth, this is amazing. So all Christians, everyone should be running into prayer. Oh, because I'm going to get what I ask. But the paradox is we don't like prayer. Prayer is amongst the, the most unpopular, unpopular activities in the church. If you talk about songs, you talk about the, uh, even even the sermon, people, everyone will come and listen to the sermon. But when it comes to prayer, not everyone necessarily prays when you come together as a church. And we see that. When we were singing the song, I believe everyone was singing. When I'm preaching now, preaching now, I believe everyone is listening. But when we say, let's all pray together, not everyone prays. And I'm not saying that those who do not pray loudly are not praying because you can also pray silently. But if you are honest with each other, 
Not necessarily everyone is praying. Now, so this is a paradox. And the paradox is further illustrated in these two verses. Now, we're reading this verse in Matthew 21, verse 13. Jesus said, it is written, he said to them, my house would be called the house of prayer. So, the house of God, which is the church, is supposed to be the house of prayer. So, if there is one activity that really characterizes the church, it is prayer. That's what this verse says, that my house is the house of prayer. But what is the house? The house is not this building, as you know. The house is when you and I we gather together. This is the church. The church is not the building. The church is when Christians gather together. That's where that's when they form the church. And you see that in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit? Our bodies, when we gather together, we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. So we form the house. When you have received from God, you are not your own. So when we gather together, we form the house. So this house, we, when we gather together, one of our key main purposes, goals, focus should be prayer. Because Jesus says, my house is the house of prayer. So prayer must be what characterizes us. But is that true? The, the, the reality is it is not true. Prayer is not what characterizes us. We just have to ask ourselves how much time, how many time, how many hours, how often we go into prayer. And the answer is few compared to other activities. So there is a paradox. On one hand, Jesus say that, hey man, I give you a great promise. You ask whatever, if you believe, you will receive. So it's wonderful, but at the same time, we don't do it. So there is a paradox. And I hope the sermon of today will help us to clarify this paradox. And make it something consistent, something logical, actually. It should be. The paradox is not logical, by definition. In this verse, Paul is writing to the church of Corinthians, and he said something very important. He said, when you come together, so when we come together, each of you has an in or a word of instruction, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation. Everything must be done so that the church may be built up. So when we gather together, everyone brings something. That's what this verse says. You cannot come in the house. I mean, you cannot be, because house is, you are part of the house. So it means like, if this building, so if you represent this wall, and you come, and you don't participate, you don't contribute into the congregation fellowship, into the congregational prayer, it's like this house, this wall is missing. This house will collapse. Because this wall is supposed to support the structure. And this verse says that everyone comes with something. So, and that something is a wrong prayer. So if you come, if I come in the congregation and I remain silent, there is a problem. And I hope this sermon will help us to address this problem. Now what we are going to do now, we are going to go through the Lord's Prayer that everyone knows. Our Father in heaven, our Lord will be your name. Everyone knows, I believe. We are going through this prayer verse by verse and understand what Jesus means here because he tells this is how you should pray. So we have been given instruction how to pray. Some people say, oh, I don't know how to pray. The instruction has been given. And hopefully the Holy Spirit will help us to understand what is the true prayer. Because unfortunately, even some of us, when we open our mouth and we pray in the congregation, actually, we are not praying correctly. And maybe that's the reason why we don't enjoy praying. That I hope we are going to understand what a pleasing, acceptable prayer is from the Lord Himself. Now, the first verse, the first verse in the Lord's Prayer says, And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to say to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. I highlight it in red color, some of the key words. Now, first of all, we see the word when. Now, Jesus could have used another word like, if you pray, but he didn't say if you pray, he said when you pray, and he repeats this at least three times. So this means Jesus expects that everyone has a time of prayer. 
When it is the time, that's what it means. When it comes to the time of prayer, it means everyone should pray. Everyone has a time of prayer. That's what it means this way. It's not an option. He considered that this is basic. But we have to see what is a true prayer. Because maybe we never do the true prayer. So let's move on. And then another word is seen by orders and rewards. So basically these words, and if you remember the previous sermons, these words, they talk about the attitude of the so Pharisees, basically, they pray in order to be seen. So this is about the attitude of prayer. And you know, brothers and sisters, before Jesus starts the Lord's Prayer, this is going to start in a couple of verses, but he's preparing the ground. He's telling the disciples how you come into prayer. So when we go into prayer, there is an attitude. And the attitude is as important as the content of our prayer. You cannot just say, you know, it doesn't matter how I pray. What matters is what I say to God. No. Your attitude matters. Your attitude tells a lot. And God going to say into detail. So you say here, the attitude, there must be a proper attitude to pray. In the case of the Pharisees, they pray in order to be seen. But what is the right attitude? What is the good attitude when we come to pray? What is the way we should come and present ourselves before the Lord? So that's lead us to the next verse to see what is the correct attitude. And then here, oh, sorry. The, verse 6. But when you pray, this is the right attitude. Go into your room, close the door, and pray to your father who is unseen. Then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Now, this. This is about the right attitude. You remember the previous attitude was that of the Pharisees. They wanted to boast. They wanted to show that they are, you know, people who pray very well. But we have to be careful because this is about pride. But you know, we, you remember we said that pride is not necessarily the one that is boasting in a such evident, obvious way. You know, he's boasting and praying, making long prayers. And we see that sometimes in some churches or in some meeting, prayer meetings, people can make very long prayers, they quote verses, they are very impressive, they show all the knowledge about the scriptures, they show that they have great memories. Uh, I'm not saying that all people who do this are not doing the right thing. I'm saying that if they are doing it in order to be seen, it's not correct. But there is also a subtle way of pride which is, for instance, to say, I'm not going to open my mouth. I pray in my heart, actually, because I'm not so familiar with prayer. I know I'm not a man or a woman of prayer. But if I open my mouth in this congregation, they will realize that, oh, I don't practice prayer on my daily basis. So I'm going to be ashamed. So I'm going to remain silent. And I will have an attitude of someone who is very humble and who doesn't open his mouth. But actually, it's the same pride. It's just the other extreme. So there is a right attitude, which is somewhere in between. And we are going to see that in that verse. It says, when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your father. Now, when I was a young Christian in faith, I used to think that this means I go into my room, my, my house, and I pray privately. I thought, I thought it was about privacy. I have to be alone, and nobody sees me, and uh, when I come to public, I don't have to pray in public. Because this says, you have to close the door and be in your room. But this, is, this cannot be true because we see in the Bible that there are many instances where men of God, women of God, they pray in public. Actually, the Lord itself, Jesus Christ, in what I consider to be the greatest prayer in the Bible, in John 17, when he prays before his arrestation, and he did that prayer in front of the disciples, and they recorded that prayer, so prayer, it doesn't mean here that you have to pray, lock the doors, nobody should see you, just between you and God. That's not the meaning here. The meaning here is about authenticity. Now, you know, lovers, lovers in the house, the room where people are the most authentic is the bedroom. Because this is where the lovers, the husband, the wife, they go, they lock the door, and then they remove their clothes and they have intimacy. This is a place where they are without any clothes, without any veil. This is a place where they are themselves. 
and they give themselves to each other. The point here is about authenticity. It's about the, the most inner chamber of our privacy, which is our heart. The things in our heart, when it comes to prayer, we have to pull them out, pull them, pull out those things before the Lord. It means we cannot hide anything in prayer. When we come before God, we must come naked, spiritually speaking. That's what it means. It means when we come, we cannot have double, we cannot uh, uh, have a certain uh, story that we share in the prayer and another story that we hide for ourselves. One brother in this church, uh, he's not here, Zach. Zach is not here. Oh, okay, he's, he's babysitting, I guess. Uh, Zach is a good example. When he goes into the time of prayer, when we are together, because actually, brothers and sisters, and this is the prayer, my prayer for our church, is that we become one. When Zach comes in the time of prayer for him, we are one with him. He opened his heart. He said, I'm struggling, struggling with this. He considered that this is a safe place. A place where the Holy Spirit is. He humbles himself. And you know what the Bible says? God, in Psalm 18, verse 27, you save the humble, says the, Lord, the, the Bible, but to bring low those who are proud. Zach is the kind of guy who will come and will share what is going on. And in the time of prayer, that's what it means. Your father who is, sees what is done in secret, in secret, what is going on in your life. You know, there is a reason why there is a fellowship. And the reason is to break our pride. If you are alone, you can manage. But if you are together, you have to share. And as you share, you are going to be broken. And God loves broken spirit. And as you share, this is the secret. There is no more secret. What is in the secret? You reveal. And as you reveal, then you get your reward. Then your prayer is answered. The reward is the answer to the prayer. That's why Jesus said, if you believe whatever you ask, the point is, you must come naked and believe and give to the Lord. And that's the reason why some of us, we don't like prayer because we don't see anything coming out of prayer. We pray, nothing happens. Yeah, because we don't pray the right way. Because we don't pray as the Lord explained to you. We hide things, we play a game, we show a different face. But actually, we are the same body. One body. The Bible doesn't talk about bodies. It talks about the body of Christ. One body. Now, let's move on to the next. It's about the attitude. And here we see... When you come and you open yourself, only broken spirit, as I say, the humble spirit, God can work with them. God cannot work with us. He cannot. And when we give the right of, to God to come and open and to work in us, then the Holy Spirit takes control. And when you pray, you don't pray anymore by yourself. The problem is, many of us, we pray with our own spirit. We decide, okay, I'm going to say this, I'm going to say that, I'm going to say this, and I'm going to hide this, I'm going to share this. When you pray, the reason why I just said everything you ask will be given, actually, it is true because everything you ask through the Holy Spirit, if it is the desire of the Holy Spirit, it will be given because the Holy Spirit is God. So we must pray by the Spirit. Do we pray by the Spirit? And that Romans 8, verse 26, 27 says, in the same way the Spirit helps us in our weakness. Our weakness, remember, you pull out everything. You show your weakness. What is in secret? In our weakness, we do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us to wordless growth. And who searches our heart knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will, with the will of God. We were singing this song, that says, Jesus, you are the center, and I'm lost without you. Yes. You come to prayer, you come lost. You come lost. We are lost without him. And as you are lost, the Holy Spirit takes control. You say, I'm your weakness. Okay, I take control. And he is the one praying for you. You know, brothers and sisters, you can look at different men and women of God. The great... I don't like to say great men of God. You know what I like to say. There is no great men of God. There are only tiny 
a weak man of a great God. But let's say those that God has used mightily, these ones, you will find they have one common denominator. It is the life of prayer. Check the life of prayer of your pastor. Check it. If you have a pastor that doesn't have a life of prayer, that doesn't worship God on his knees day and night, your church has a problem. The Holy Spirit takes control when you go into prayer. It's no more you. You don't know what to ask. That's what he says. Luke 11 verse 9 and 10 say, So, I say to you, and ask it will be given to you. Seek and it and you will be sorry, and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. Basically, what Jesus is telling here is this reward here, this reward is certain, is guaranteed. You know, the you know prayer is a is a strange thing. It's a strange thing. You come, you speak to someone that you don't see. You are not sure that person doesn't respond. You are like a fool. You speak alone. If someone pass by, look at you, say, this person has a problem. You speak alone. Nobody responds. Responds, sorry. And as if it's not enough, sometimes you even raise your hand. You even close your eyes. It's a very strange activity. And for some people, this is very weird. You think prayer is weird. But you know why? why? Why we do it? Because there is a reward. The reward is certain. The reason why some of us struggle with prayer, they go into prayer. We come into prayer. We are not sure whether the person we are speaking to is going to answer. We, we throw the word like gambling and hopefully maybe we reply mm, let's see no 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 brothers and sisters that's not what the lord is teaching us here the what the lord is teaching us here it is certain you will be rewarded if you pray according to his instructions if you humble yourself you will be rewarded there will be an answer there is always an open ear for an open heart an open hand for an open mouth you must be certain. Those who love prayer, when they come into prayer, they come with a certainty. They come with an assurance. They don't go and say, oh, let's see. No, they go knowing that something is going to happen. That makes a difference between those who love prayers and those who do not. We don't go to prayer just like this. We go because we know there's a reward. And indeed, when you experience that reward, it changes you love prayer. You know, when you pray for people, they, you probably know the story of our friends, uh, Michelle and Emira in India, that we keep sharing with you because this is amazing. We and Marina, we were living together next to a couple in India. So their house was next to, I mean, not far from our house, uh, in the same compound, just like here. And uh, the woman, the wife was Muslim. The man was a, a good atheist. Uh, he was a very clever guy. He went to Cambridge uh, University in London. He's, he's very bright and he doesn't believe he's atheist. But we love them. And they like our company. And we pray for them and say, Lord, do a miracle. When you look at it, it's just impossible. They cannot, I mean, when you look at it from a rational point of view, they will not become Christian. He's atheist, she's Muslim. How this can happen? We took a time. We took time, when we say time, we took hours with Marina on a weekly basis praying for them. You know what? Today, they are more extreme than us. He is more extreme. He's an extremist. He's a theologian, a sound theologian. He's even teaching me things on the Bible now. This is just maybe five years or six years ago. Oh, sorry, seven years? Seven years ago, something like that. When you see this, when you are rewarded in your prayer, you pray for something in spirit and God answers. And I have plenty of examples. This is just one. Plenty of examples. When you are rewarding your prayer, you love prayer. This is when you keep going into prayer. Now the next verse. Let's, let's move on. Verse 7. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for 